So welcome to the talk, Fast Kubernetes Development with Telepresence. My name is Cesar. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I also sometimes write about Kubernetes on Medium. So the structure of the talk is quite simple. Uh, first, I want to introduce some sort of use case context so we kind of know what we're talking about. Then I want to show you what the problem is, one solution, and then one demo. So the, it's going to be half slides, half demo. So the context, I think, is something quite, uh, that should be familiar with most of you. We want to deploy, uh, make an application accessible to users, so we kind of have a cloud provider. It can be anything you want. Then, because we want to do Docker, we installed Kubernetes on top of it. And then we deploy a bunch of services, microservices, components, however, however you want to call them. There are like some components that together deliver a business value. Because we are in um, Kubernetes, uh, we have Kubernetes services sorry, in front of them um, that help with load balancer and service discovery. We might have some sort of config server, like if you're in Spring, you can use the Spring config server that will allow you to, do, to give a config uh, dynamically. Or you might also be using um, so like config maps, uh, that is more like the native Kubernetes way of doing it. Um, you might have some service directly talking to each other, more like uh, um, the orchestration pattern. Or you might also have some element of choreography with a, like a message queue, like RabbitMQ or Kafka, and some sort of event, uh, event, event driven architecture. Um, you might also have some sort of component that is outside of your cluster. So an example is storage. It's kind of hard to manage state in Kubernetes, so you might want to have a database as a service like RDS or MongoDB Atlas, so that it is outside of your cluster. Uh, because you want to be able to serve users, you will have a load balancer, and you know, worst of it, you will have business users kind of talking to your uh, cluster. So when you look at all of that, you will be kind of like, you know, I mean, if you want to... to um, to develop on this is like, I can't you know, run all of this. I mean, you might if you have three microservices, if you've got 20, you will really struggle on one laptop to run all of this. So the, the conclusion is, well, I need to have a, a test cluster, a dev cluster. So you, however you want to call it, it will be a, another Kubernetes cluster that is very similar to the one that you have in production, and you can uh, deploy something on it and see if it works. So the, the, um, the naive way of doing this is, let's say we've got our developer, we've got a pod that we want to uh, make a new deployment, so we write some code, and the first thing we need to do is to compile. So here I'm going to put a bunch of timings. It's very impossible to say it's going to be the same for everyone, but it really is like ballpark figures. It doesn't take one second to compile, it doesn't take five minutes, you know, it depends. So it's kind of like, you know, 30 seconds to compile. Um, so then we have got a jar file or whatever, we need to dockerize it, so we need it to do a docker build. Again, I put 30 seconds, it could be less, it could be more, really depending how you're building your Docker file and layers and things like that. So once we've done that, we need to push that to the Docker reg registry. So again, really depending on your network, on how clever you, you manage your, your layers in Docker. But again, all of these is kind of like, it takes a bit of time. Then what we need to do is we need to use a manual uh, kubectl command to delete the pod and wait for Kubernetes to restart it. So that's instant. But then your service has to restart. So, you know, it might be five seconds if you're using a very state-of-the-art latest thing. If you have some late um, legacy Spring app, it might take two minutes. So all of this together, we, it's almost kind of reaching three minutes. And we kind of get the feeling that, I mean, it's not hours, it's not seconds. It's in the realms of minutes. Um, so it's not, it's not really ideal. We would like, we would like something that is a bit, uh, bit faster. Um, so there is one solution, is uh, Telepresence. So it's an open source tool uh, built by a company called DataWire. And uh, the idea is quite simple, is that let's say in this case we've got our dev cluster and we want to work on the service B. So what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, locally on our machine, we're going to start a local process. And Telepresence will create a VPN proxy that will tr uh, um, proxy the traffic both ways. So, um, and what it will do as well, it will remove um, the original pod B and it will rewire everything in Kubernetes so that this proxy pod behaves like the normal uh, B. So if you've got some traffic coming that wants to talk to service uh, B, it will be forward to your laptop. And the other way as well, so your laptop is effectively in the cloud. So within your laptop, if you want to talk to service A or to RabbitMQ or to the config, you will, you, it will be the same. All of the environment variables, the config map, the secret, everything you can imagine will be as well um, transferred into your, to your uh, local process. So it really is, you really get the, the best of both worlds. You are, you're only running one process, and yet you get all of the benefit of being in the cloud. As many, you, know, you can have as many, la as many services as you want. Your, your machine is only running one process. So 
to really show you, I think I'll, I'll, I want to do demo, and I have a very, very simple uh, demo for that. Um, I've got uh, two pods. One of them is called Quote of the Moment. It's just a REST API that uh, generate, generates random uh, quote as JSON. And I've got a service I call Telequark because I wanted to use uh, Quarkus for DevOps to be hipster. So it uses Kotlin and Quarkus, and it just talks to this API and returns the quote as plain text. So uh, let's see now if my demo works. So just to show you the, the code very briefly, uh, I've got a quote. Can you all read well like this? Yeah. So I've got a quote of the moment client that just uh, gets a quote object that's a JSON. So quote is a very simple class with two fields, quote and version. I'm not using version. Uh, and then I've got a um, what I call enhanced resource. So that's my, my own service that will listen to the uh, uh, quote uh, path. And at the moment, it does very stupid. It just call the client, get a quote, get the quote, and just returns it as a, as a plain text. So it's kind of like quite, uh, quite simple. So um, if I look at my pods, uh, in my namespace Cesar, I've got two pods, the quote of the moment, my pod telequark, and everything is behind the load balancer. So here, if I do a curl on this uh, URL, I'm getting a reply, and this is all deployed in the cloud. So now on, this, on here, uh, I will run a telepresence. So to show you first, I will show you, I've got a little, uh, file here. So all it does is just run telepresence as a command, and I want to swap the deployment telequark uh, by my local process in the namespace Cesar, and then I'm just doing a run, and I'm running the common maven quark is dev. So it's quite simple. So if I just do that, so here is going to start, and here I'm watching, and I can see that the original pod has been deleted, and I, if I do another curl now, I'm not getting a reply, because at the moment, the proxy is forwarding, and my local process is not running. Uh, so now I can see that Quarkus uh, started. So now if I come here and if I do the request, I'm getting a reply. So not really exciting because it looks exactly the same. But the difference is that I can come back to my, um, to my IntelliJ, and I can say, let's say, hello, DevOps, and I compile. It's a local process, so it just compiles, and now if I do another curl here, Quarkus will detect um, that there was a hot replace, and I'm getting hello DevOx back. So here, I made a code change, and I got instantly, I got all the feedback I wanted. Um, there's a, I, we can do that even a bit more than that. So if I stop it, now we can see that uh, when I'm watching my pods, the, uh, the, the proxy has been deleted, the Quarkus pod has started very quickly, because it has really nothing, and if I, do a curl again, now I, I'm getting the original unchanged uh, service. We all okay with that at the moment? Yeah? So it's interesting because what we can do, um, we can do a bit more than that. If I just add at the end uh, debug, so that's the debug uh, option of Quarkus. So now what it will do, it will um, start the process the same, but it will, it will wait on port 5005 for a debugger to connect. So I'm doing that. Again, it's restarting. So now we see that it says, you know, listening on the port. So if I'm doing a curl now, nothing happens because um, my REST controller hasn't started. But if I come back to my IntelliJ, you know, if I the shortcut for debugging, now I'm connected to my local process. And here, it received the connection. And now if I'm doing a curl, it works. What I can do is I can just put a breakpoint. And if I just make a curl here, I have here, uh, I'm in the debugger. And I, I didn't show you, but I can show you the, um, the YAML file that I'm using for this deployment. So I've got a deployment, I've got my image, and I've got some environment variables. I've got a, a fixed one called foo with value bar, and I've got another one, one big secret, um, that is pulling value from a, a secret that is here. So here I'm in a debugger, so I can explore. So I can say system, get environment, uh, or what is foo? It's bar. What is one big secret, it's ABC123. So here, I, you know, it's, kind of, it's all kind of nice sometimes with the debugger to kind of explore the sort of things you can do. So, you know, I can do something very stupid. I can go back here, I'm gonna continue that request. I could say, you know, here is the secret. Um, sorry. Um, system, environment, and then the, sorry, one big secret, I can compile that. Time. 
So I'm not debugging anymore, but I can still get the, yeah, one big secret ABC. Um, another interesting thing as well is that, so I'm gonna refresh that just to show you the pods again. Um, I am, my laptop is effectively in the cloud because of all of these uh, kind of forwarding of traffic. So I, I could even, if I wanted, I could myself talk to the original service. So if I just do a, a curl of quote of the moment in the namespace Caesar, I'm getting a JSON res response. So th this is the same JSON that my service is getting, but I am effectively, I am in the cloud. I can do all sorts of DNS check. I can talk to any, any, any um, component that are in, in, in the cloud. Um, so yeah, so I think it's a, it's kind of a very powerful way of getting really quick feedback. Uh, so here I, I showed, if I show you the, um, the command again that I run, so, so you've got different ways of running it. So here I'm, I'm using the run. So what it's gonna do is just runs a local process so that can work with anything, any technology that you have, Python, anything that can start as a process and listen to traffic, you can do it. Another way what you can do is you can also run a Docker image. So here I'm, I'm compiling the, um, I'm compiling the, the Java and Kotlin code on my machine, but if I didn't want this, I could run, let's say, a Maven container. Uh, I would, um, I would, to make it efficient, I would have to uh, create a, a shared uh, folder with the Maven cache and uh, the source code, and I could let that happen inside the Maven. But it's just different flavor of the same thing, really. So if I come back here, um, what's kind of the, the future for telepresence? So the Still waiting for the 1.0 release. I think at the moment it's like 0.96 or 97, I'm not sure. The reason uh, it's a bit hard is that to do all of this magic, it does a lot of like really, uh, I want to say dodgy stuff with IP tables and uh, network forwarding. And it's really hard because it vastly varies between OS or even sometimes between different versions of Mac OS. You will have different uh, sort of API that you can use. So the, the team has been kind of struggling to make it really stable on, all OS, on OS. Uh, another thing they want to do as well is to kind of to so to do telepresence they had to build a lot of tools uh, and it's kind of in this uh, monolith of called telepresence and they realized that it might be actually be useful to be able to reuse some of these components uh, in a different context so they, the the team uh, I mean it's all open source on GitHub the team has been trying to to break that down so um, it can be reused in a better way um, that's kind of what I had uh, we've got three minutes for questions I can do more demos. If, yes? Does it work for what, sir? Uh, no, this is, a, this is a Kubernetes tool. This is Kubernetes, yeah. Yeah? So, kind of like you basically connect to the, if that proxy you call it, it's like kind of like the pod. You just connect to the pod and you are inside the pod. Yes? Uh, okay, so the question, so just to clarify how it works, um, Yes, so the, 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 the original pod, your, your normal service B, this pod is being killed and it's replaced by another one, which is a proxy pod. It pretends, it tells Kubernetes, yes, I'm this pod B, but every traffic that comes in, it's sent back to your laptop. So it, that can be a bit dangerous as well. You have to kind of be careful. Obviously, this is not for production. And then within my laptop, it kind of, I don't really, I'm not really a networking expert, so I don't pretend to understand all of it. But as you've seen, I, I just did a curl for the other one. I mean, now if I, if I come back here, actually, just to, to, to make that point, perhaps, if I stop um, Quark is here, and if I'm trying to make the same call, I, the, it says I, cannot, I don't know what, what this host is. It, it doesn't exist locally. So it, it really is this, this forwarding both ways. I, I am, your laptop becomes, can access everything that your pod normally would, and all the traffic. So I think it's really powerful because, um, you know, as I said, it can work with REST API, uh, uh, message queues, config service, anything that you would, you know, config map, environment variables, everything is there, is preserved. It looks exactly the same. Uh, yes? Yes, yes. Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, none, none. Um, actually, that's a good question. Well, so the, the thing is that, so, so this is for development. So uh, typically your, your dev cluster is gonna be relatively uh, open, but it's a good question. I don't know actually. Um, I, think, <coughs> I think you will need permission around modifying deployments because behind the scene, it, it modifies the deployment. So I guess you would need permissions around that. I don't think you would need anything more than that. I don't think you need to read secrets or things like that because, yeah. Ah. That's a good, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, question about networking. Yeah, that's a good, uh, I honestly, I don't know. I, will, I, can, I can follow this up. Uh, I don't see, because basically it make, it's making a private VPN connection to my laptop, so I don't really see how, unless you don't have some strict network policies in, in, uh, in Kubernetes, I don't know if you could stop that. Okay, I think that my time is up. Thank you.